Welcome back to simulation. Earlier on, we were using the uniform distribution as an example of how we can calculate the cumulative distribution function of a specified uh, value. <clears throat> now let's move on to another slightly more complicated but much more commonly observed distribution, uh, and that's called normal distribution, the typical bell curve that you might have heard of. Now to specify the normal distribution, we need two numbers, the population mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma. So for example, if a random variable capital X uh, is said to follow normal distribution, we write it symbolically as X tilde uh, capital N for normal distribution, uh, followed by the two numbers uh, in this order, the population mean, for example, 100, and the population standard deviation 10 and it is typical that we write a square uh, to signify the variance but we leave it in this form right so that we can easily read off the population standard deviation all right <clears throat> now what sort of uh, random variable typically follows normal distribution uh, example heights weights and anything that basically has a specified uh, target value Right, so if you take the height of uh, students or a cohort of people, you might find that when you plot it out as a histogram, it exhibits some sort of a bell curve. It should. All right, so, so that is basically uh, normal distribution in practice. Now, uh, why is it that when, when uh, measurements are required to tend towards a specified value, uh, why is it that then it will tend to exhibit bell curve? Now the idea is, is that, for example, in a cohort of students of 20 years old, um, our DNA says that at 20 years old, we are supposed to be at an average height of, let's say, 1.6 meters. Now, some of us will grow a bit taller, some of us will grow a bit shorter, but it should not be a drastic difference, right? As your common sense will tell you. And, and that's why uh, when you take the measurements of people who are supposed to be uh, whose DNA require them to be aiming towards a particular height, example 1.6 meters, they will exhibit you know, some fluctuations and that fluctuation tends to be symmetric around the average, uh, which is therefore giving rise to this very commonly observed normal distribution. But let's now focus on calculation. So we ask um, <clears throat> the same question, what is the probability of x, the normal distribution, uh, less than or equal to a particular number, right? So we ask p of x, example, less than or equal to minus two. Let's look at the green curve, more, more because it's protruding to the left, so it's easier to illustrate. So the green curve here has a mean of minus two and a standard deviation of 0 0.5, okay? Now, the idea is, what is the probability of uh, the green curve uh, to the left of minus two? In other words, what's the area of uh, under the green curve from minus infinity to minus two. So as we learned in the previous example, this can be rewritten as CDF of minus two. All right, because that's the definition and it's just a symbolic change. Now let's look at the upstairs uh, bell curve. When we want the probability, we basically ask a geometrical question. What's the area under the green curve uh, shaded from minus infinity to the given point minus two, all right? Uh, what is our answer? Answer is that uh, even if you don't know how to find the area of a bell curve, we know that all distributions must have an area summing up to one. And normal distribution is symmetrical around the mean, so, uh, but minus two is the mean. Therefore, we know that the left half must be minus, uh, sorry, 0 0.5. So while we can use our, <clears throat> you know, implicit knowledge about distributions to answer this, we can also check out the green CDF curve below. So as before, we, we shoot a laser beam upwards from the given point, minus two, because that's our input, hits the green curve, and then we can move to the left because uh, it's like a mirror rotate, uh, reflecting off to the left, and the y-axis says 0 0.5. So our answer is that it will be 0 0.5. Okay, simple as that. All right, so now that we ask the question, all right, we like to know 
what is the value of on the x-axis such that when we find the area to the left of it we get the area 0 0.5 okay i know you know the answer but let's not look at the first line and appreciate that whoa this is a little bit challenging right fortunately the answer on the right hand side is 0 0.5 so again by some intuition we can guess and know that the answer in the question mark must be minus 2 for the green curve but if we look at the CDF curve below, it becomes way easier because remember, earlier on, we were saying that we shine the laser beam upwards from minus 2, right? Now the question is an inverted form. That is, what is the minus 2? Where is this question mark such that our y-axis is 0 0.5, right? So now, geometrically, that means on this diagram, let's begin on the given which is the y-axis, we, we can, nobody says we cannot start in y-axis, we start at the y-axis at the point 0 0.5, because that's a given. We now shine a laser beam towards the right, hits the green curve, and it now bounces downwards to give us minus 2. I assume we have no problem seeing that, right? Because it's right angle, if you can shine it upwards, to hit the point, you can put the laser beam the other way around, it shines backwards and hits the same point on the ground, which is minus 2. Alright, so we can therefore say that the answer is minus 2. But let's put it in a way that allows us to say that the answer therefore on the right side is minus 2. So the way we say the same thing is this. We ask the question, right? Um, what is the inverse CDF of 0 0.5 okay calculate the inverse CDF of 0 0.5 and the answer is minus 2 and you see that so the inverse CDF allows us uh, nothing new here is just a easier convenient and conceptually more straightforward way of saying here is the input 0 0.5 but look this is CDF okay not an x-axis value therefore go to the y-axis so Go to the y-axis, go to the height of 0 0.5, tell me what value of x gives me 0 0.5 when we reverse the operations. Yeah. Okay. So the concept of inverse CDF is precisely what we are after here. Okay. Let's say that again because it's so important, right? Find the inverse CDF of a given value. And this given value, because it is a CDF, it is a cumulative uh, distribution function, it has to range between 0 to 1. All, right? all CDFs on Earth must range between 0 to 1. No more, no less. Okay, So it's a number between 0 to 1. And uh, because it's infinitely precise, the right-hand side can go from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, So, so it is a very, very uh, small to enormously large mapping. So answer is minus 2. Now, in case this is bothering you, uh, think again because we have seen inverse functions a lot. I, I would uh, really not uh, be hesitant to show you, for example, sine of uh, pi over 2. <clears throat> That's, uh, well, supposed to be 1, right? So um, what is the inverse sine or we say what is the arc sine of 1? Yeah, so we say what is the value of that we provide to sign so that we get the value of 1 on the right side. <clears throat> so the way we say it is arc sine of 1 equals to pi over 2. And arc sine is therefore the inverse sign, right? So we can also write inverse sine of 1 is pi over 2. So we have seen that a lot. And now I'm just inviting you to extend the inverse concept, the inverse function concept to CDF. Okay. Now, it is. it may be mind-boggling if you see this first time uh, because CDF is an uh, integration of the area to the left of a given point under the probability distribution. Wow, you know. But just, well, sine function is also very complex and you can master it. So I would say just, you know, take it as a black box. CDF is very complicated, doesn't matter. But uh, just think of it as the inverse operation. Now, CDF function... Uh, changes from distribution to distribution. So if it's a normal distribution function, 
well, we should actually say the inverse CDF of normal distribution. If it is a uniform distribution, it will be the inverse CDF of the norm, uh, uniform distribution that we are talking about. So that the right hand side answer will be different if you have different distributions. Okay, so now very importantly, quick recap, inverse CDF is what we want. Yeah, okay. Now, let's look at how we do this uh, in Excel. Okay, instead of looking at the slide, why don't we just go straight to the Excel pattern graph and see for ourselves how we can do that in Excel. 